welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicke and as always I'm here with Matt Stewart and Jess Perkins. Hello, I'm Jess Perkins. Hello, I'm Matt Stewart. Dave, how does this show work? Well, what we do here, Matt, is we take it in turns to report on a topic often suggested by one of our beautiful listeners. And whoever's turn, it is to report, goes away, does a bit of research and then brings that back to the group. And it is my turn to report on the topic this week. Isn't it crazy that all of our listeners are really hot? Oh, we we have a very big vetting system that y- y- if you're listening, you're not aware of it, but we are and we know how hot you are, so congratulations. It's like a sorority. We like we look at pictures of you and your interests mm. and we go, yay or nay. <laughs> and for everyone listening, it was three big yays. So well done. We actually bought Zuckerberg's early technology. <laughs> <laughs> the pre-Facebook Facebook, that's what we use. The Facebook. <laughs> we always start with a question. And to get us onto topic, this is my question for both of you. All right, I'm going to give you a bit of a list here. What do the following things all have in common? Okay. Okay, we've got the Chicago Cubs. Okay, curse. Well, you've already got it. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the others. All right, Jess, Sorry. for your benefit, I was going to say the Power Rangers. Uh-huh. The Otzi Iceman. Yes. And finally, Tutankhamen. Oh, they're all past episodes of ours, Dave. That's the other thing. Have we done episodes on all these? Apart from the Cubs. Uh, yes, because we're going to talk about that today. They've all been cursed. We are talking about the curse of the Billy Goat. Oh. <laughs> okay. Do, you, I do either of you know anything about this? Confused. Matt went straight to curse. I'm thinking that maybe you got a bit of info here. I well, no, I just know that. So is the curse of the Billy Goat that is the Chicago Cubs curse? It it definitely is. Yeah, right. No, I I I knew they were cursed, but and I'm similar to the curse of the Great Bambini. At um, <laughs> we're going to talk that about that a, as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which is another baseball curse. I don't know why they came to my mind. I just know they were on. They had a, a huge losing streak. It was so much so that it was a joke in Back to the Future that um, in the future the Cubs won the World yeah, Series. That's right. Yes, that's that's absolutely right. And that's because of the curse of the Billy Goat, which we will get to. This one was suggested uh, by three beautiful people and voted for by our Patreon supporters. So I put up our four sporting topics because one of my favourite. Reports to research last year was the uh, a tale of two dream teams, mm. uh, yes. the USA and Lithuania in the uh, Olympics. So I put up four sporting topics and this one did win. So thanks to everyone that voted and thanks to the people that suggested it, which is Daniel Garrett from Nashville, Tennessee, Troy Partridge from Adelaide and Timothy Poulton also from South Australia. So thank you very much. All right, well, let's jump in. Now, baseball, as Matt has alluded to, has a long series of curses. It's a very cursed sport. (laughs) Uh, Over the years, they've had the curse of the Bambino that affected the Boston Red Sox, who didn't win a championship for 86 years after selling Babe Ruth to the Yankees in the 1920s. Babe Ruth's nickname was the Great Bambino, so that's where that comes from. Uh, There's also the curse of the Colonel which affected the Japanese team, the Han Shin Tigers. In 1985, fans celebrated their team winning the Japanese Championship Series, which is a massive deal in Japan. As each winning player was read out during celebrations, a drunken fan jumped into the Dotonbori River, each fan representing one of the players. That's the idea there. But finally, they got to American first baseman Randy Bass, or Randy Bass. I did look it up. But uh, he was a Caucasian man with a beard and the Japanese fans didn't have anyone in the area who looked enough like him to jump in the river as his representative. So instead they grabbed a statue of the colonel from a nearby KFC and threw it in the river (laughs) instead. (laughs) That's great. And that was a huge mistake. Oh, Oh, no. no. The statue sank and a curse was subsequently placed on them for disrespecting the colonel. They did not win a championship after that. Was anybody surprised the statue (laughs) sank? They're like, oh, that's a bit odd, isn't it? They put floaties on him. Statue (laughs) sank. That's odd. 
Oh, how weird. That, right, didn't we talk about in a Patreon bonus episode that, um, was it Japan that really got into KFC at Christmas time? Yeah, that's right. That Big up. deal. Millions of, of Japanese people visit KFCs on Christmas. But some of these other um, curses we're talking about lasted for nearly a century. Did you say 2015? No, 1985. Oh, okay, that's longish. That is longish. I don't know. In my head, I'm like, not an 85 is only six years yeah, ago. That's right. <laughs> well, fans well, believe. Well, you've lived as long as you have. That's true. Fans believe the curse would live on until someone retrieved the colonel from the river. Several attempts were made to recover the statue, including sending divers down and dredging the river. But sadly, wow. they, they all failed. I'm impressed they knew that it was at the bottom because they seemed very surprised that it sank. Yeah, they were so, so, so. <laughs> If they can't find it, geez, that sounds, yeah, what's going on here? That sounds more than a curse. Well, fans attempted to make amends by apologising to the store manager. but the <laughs> <laughs> A 16-year-old. Oh. Yeah, it's a manager-based curse. <laughs> uh, it's all right. Don't worry about it. We got another one. <laughs> Imagine being like, I'd like to apologise to the manager. Sorry? What? Karen? That's never happened. This is new. As someone who was, for a while, a manager in retail, that has never happened. I'd like to apologise to the manager. No, 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 no. Dave, do you think that the guy, the baseman surname being base, is that a uh, is that a, an example of nominative determinism? <laughs> yeah, I think it might be. Oh, my God. Now that you've finally brought it up and it's been kind of close... Are you going to keep bringing it up every time? Have I it broken the curse? Potentially. <laughs> Sadly for Mr. Bass, he played in the outfield, so nowhere near a base. <laughs> uh, but they apologised to the store manager, but the statue remained in the canal and the Tigers remained cursed. Before finally in 2009, the statue was found and recovered from the river in multiple pieces. However, the statue was missing an arm and the colonel's glasses and fans worry that until the statue is made whole again, they won't <laughs> win another series. They've made the championship final three times since but have lost each time. Damn you, colonel. Damn you. That's incredible. I love Jeez, that. Jeez, the odds of ever finding the glasses again, <laughs> not strong. I don't understand. What do you mean glasses? Do it have... What kind of statue is this? I think it's, I, I, I know you think you went uh, concrete, but I'm thinking I that think maybe it's one of those like plasticky ones out the front of. Like a Ronald McDonald. Yes, I think it's like that, which so it's still take a picture with. would still probably sink, I reckon. Yeah. Uh, but if they're hollow inside. Hmm. Mm. Okay, I take back some of my criticisms, <laughs> but others remain. <laughs> yeah, well, and so does that curse. But we're not here to talk about fried chicken. We're here to talk about disgruntled goats. Little mm. uh, little Simpsons reference there. But first, we've got to talk a little bit about how Major League Baseball works. Now, Matt, you've got a team seemingly in every league in every sport in the entire world. Do you have a team in the MLB? Go Detroit Tigers. Nice. I made a deal years ago with an a, a American traveller. He was in Australia and he said he'd start going for the Saints in the AFL if I got on board his uh, Major League Baseball team, which was the Detroit Tigers. And, uh, yes, yeah, so I've supported them ever since. I've bought the hat and, uh, you know, I've got their app on my phone. They haven't been good for quite a while, but, uh, you know, I keep up to date with them. They play so many games in baseball. Oh, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's, uh, for a team that isn't very good, that means a lot of losses. <laughs> oh, I didn't, never thought about it like that. <laughs> you, you, stop playing, please. You're losing. Please. Can we just end the season, please? They're going like feeling feels like slightly better than they have been this year, but still like towards the bottom of the table. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't know of any curses that they've had. Do they that doesn't mean they don't in? exist. That's, That's right. True. Sometimes you're unknowingly cursed. That's the worst kind. Yeah, I wouldn't surprise me if they were cursed based on their ladder positions. Do you feel like you you cursed your American friend by making him follow the Saints? <laughs> yeah, we've. I think we cursed each other. <laughs> Although he's he's seen at least a few good years, you know, where this was back before our you know grand finals ten years ago. So uh, at least he he had some close to glory <laughs> days. <laughs> Now, I uh, I only, I must admit here, I only vaguely understood 
terms like the World Series and how the league and its divisions worked before this. So for the sake of the curse and explaining it, just to set up any baseball noobs like me and set them straight here, this is what I've learned. Jess, I don't know, your baseball knowledge, probably second to none, I imagine. I've seen a league of their own. (laughs) It's all I require. A great film, Madonna, Rosie O'Donnell, need I say more? Probably. (laughs) Go on. Uh... Gina Davis, oh, she's Tom great, Hanks, man. he pisses oh, on the bus at one point. He pisses for so long in the rooms. Oh, he doesn't piss on the bus. He pisses by the bus. In the rooms, thank you. He's pissing and he's pissing just nonstop. Great non-stop moment. Piss. Great Hollywood moment. <laughs> Ladies playing baseball. What? what? It'll well, never the work. War. The boys ain't here. Come on, gals. That's what, doesn't he say that at one point? Women don't play baseball. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. That was a good movie. Great movie. Based so, yes, Dave, story. I know baseball. I thought okay. you did. So this is for me and for anyone like me at home, any uh, fellow Poindexters out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Major League Baseball, like the NBA, is broken into two divisions, the American League and the National League. But unlike the NBA, it's not geographically based. Both Teams on both sides are all over the USA and one team in Canada, the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, These days there are 15 teams in each of the two leagues who play their own regular seasons, which in 2021 is an unbelievable 162 games. What? Yeah. (laughs) And that's before before playoffs and the World Series. Everyone's playing at least 100. Is there an off season? Yeah, it goes for about 15 minutes and then you get back out there. Logistically how? Are they playing like three games a week? More, statistically. Get the fuck out. (laughs) No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, please. It's, oh, I'm tired thinking about it. Oh, it's absolutely wild, isn't it? That's too much. They play a lot of double headers, don't they? Maybe triple headers? They ever play triple headers? Still. They have to play like, oh, we've got a game at 3 a.m. on a Tuesday <laughs> just to fucking fit it in. Yeah. And then, are people going to that? That's crazy. And, uh, and it doesn't end there. At the end of each regular season, which is the 162 games, five of each league go to the postseason where one of each team is named either American League or National League champion. You can honestly go get fucked. <laughs> that is too much. And then it doesn't end there, Jess. The champions... What? <laughs> no, the champions of the American League play against the champions of the National League in the World Series... And this... Oh, World Series, yes, of course, <laughs> that we all go to, yeah. the world. We all, we're all there. And uh, that's a best of seven games. Get the <laughs> fuck out. It doesn't make any sense. And then the team that wins the World Series is the no. champion of Major League Baseball. So that's The champion of the, the entire universe. Yeah. And then everyone gets a rest for that's about... That's too much. What do you mean? You when get, do they get to rest? You get two hours off, you go to the mall, and then you go back out there. Okay. Oh. That's too much. Do they? Do baseball players get paid quite well? Incredibly well, yep. Do they really? Millions. Good for them. Some of them. I still wouldn't do it. Couldn't pay me enough. <laughs> uh, if, if you're like, Jess, I need you to sit down 140 times this year, I'd be <laughs> like, you got it, Chief. No problem. I'll do that for a million bucks. <laughs> That's silly. I'm sure there's a lot of baseball fans out there who are angry at me now. I'm just saying, like, work-life balance, people. Have a little bit of you time. Switch off, you know. You probably love baseball. That's why you are a professional baseball player. But now is it not a little ruined for you? But there's no, there's, so there's no value I can put on that. For example, uh, if you were Mookie Betts from the Los Angeles Dodgers, yes, his name is Mookie Betts. And, Amazing. Um, got a 12-year contract, $365 million US dollars. He's getting paid $30 million a season or 187000 a game. Yeah, I reckon that's worth it. Getting out of bed for that? I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, I figured, not for 12 years though, ugh. Um, I figured obviously like even in AFL this, the base salary is good and then you'd have like your big players who are making quite a lot of money but that's in a lot of other promo deals and stuff. That's fucking wild. Yeah, nothing like that. He'd be getting no. the AFL's full, um, <laughs> the full player salary. payments just to pay. Yeah. Every player. <laughs> oh, it's true. 
Good on you, Mookie. I've uh, I've looked up my boys, the Tigers. Wild that I haven't done this before. Or if I ever, they won the World Series in 1935, 1945, 1968, and 1984. Oh, so close to 69. Oh, Disappointing. How good would that have been? But they they played in the World Series as recently as 2012, oh. losing to the Giants. Do you remember that? No, I don't know how I missed that. Was... <laughs> That's a pretty shitty wow. app you got there. Hey, Dave, I tell you what, if you remember 2012, you weren't really there. <laughs> <laughs> they were crazy times back then, back oh, yeah. in 2012. <laughs> well, I thought the world was you. ending. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't. Last time I listened to them Mayans. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's how baseball works, which brings us to the talk of today's report, the Chicago Cubs. Now, when I say Chicago, does something come to mind? The Windy City. <laughs> yeah. Chicago. Chicago-style improv. I uh, did two levels of it, actually, personally, so, yeah. Wow. Give me a scene. <laughs> Give okay, me a... you're in Chicago. <laughs> okay. Hello there, I'm in Chicago. Oh, it's pretty windy. <laughs> Wow. And scene, did it, bang, like that. God, it was like I was transported. Yeah, that's right. Where did uh, Matt Michael you Jordan are, played there, Oprah Winfrey. You are truly very good. Oprah Winfrey got her start there, or not her start, but that's where she blew up. Uh, I think Hugh. She blew up. <laughs> she blew up. You don't remember that? You did not put that in the report. Yeah, that's big. No, How do you miss that? Yeah. She blew up. She exploded. Good <laughs> grief. <laughs> and uh, Hugh Hefner, didn't he start... Um, his uh, porn company there, I reckon. I reckon the first Probably. porn palace was there, or whatever he called it, Playboy <laughs> House. Porn palace. Is porn better. palace. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Cubs were originally known as the Chicago White Stockings. Oh. <laughs> and yeah, that's why they're cursed. <laughs> They were founded in 1876, one of eight inaugural teams in the National League. They even won the first ever National League championship. And were one of sports' first dynasties, winning six of the first 11 championship titles. Wow. So they're pretty old for American sport, 1876. Yeah. They're almost as old as the St. Kilda Saints, <laughs> who uh, started earlier that decade in 1873. Well, there you go. There you go. Well, Major League Baseball and the World Series came together in... 1903, putting the two leagues together. The Cubs continued their success and won the World Series in 1906 and 1907. So they, they're they very successful early on. Hmm. They had continued success over the next few decades, especially in their division, winning American League pennants, which means that they won their, their division, in 1910, 1918, and a hugely impressive four pennants in a 10-year span, 1929, 1932, 1935, 1938. Huge. Mm. Between 1876 and 1945, the Cubs were one of the most successful teams in all of North America. They had 51 winning seasons, 16 first place finishes, 16 pennants and World Series appearances, two World Series titles and six championship titles. But it all changed on one fateful day in 1945. Ooh. It felt like it needed an ooh. Was that yeah, a, a good instinct? Very appropriate. Thank you so much. The oh, year, uh, you know who won the World Series that year? My boys. Great year, 1944, uh, 45 in the world. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> Wars Was ended, it? World Series were won, everyone's partying, doing the bloody jitterbug all down the street. Well, 1945, Chicago Cubs again won their 16th pennant and again made the World Series where they faced... The Detroit Tigers. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have looked it up. That would have been such an exciting moment. <laughs> now, the Cubs were and still are based at Wrigley Field, named after chewing gum magnate William Wrigley Jr., who founded the Wrigley Company. So there you go. That's a good surname, Wrigley. Yeah, great like chewing it. gum name as well, I yeah. reckon. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Feels right. Perkins, not good for anything like that. Uh, maybe toilet cleaner. <laughs> Perkins because it's got a picture of a little butler and his name is Perkins. Perkins is a great butler name. Yeah, and cleans your butt. Ah, yes. Oh. Wait, do you what do you do with toilet cleaner, Matt? <laughs> yeah. You put that in your butt? Yeah, cut out the middleman. <laughs> I'm very thrifty in that way. That's actually not bad. Yeah. That way I never go to the toilet. A gentleman never shits. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, Wrigley himself also bought the Cubs in the 1920s. Very wealthy man, very influential around Chicago. Wrigley Field is nicknamed the Friendly Confines. Okay. Oh. Confines doesn't sound that friendly. I know. That's a phrase popularised by nicknamed Mr. Cub, Hall of Fame shortstop and first baseman Ernie Banks. So the Friendly Confines, we'll come back to that nickname a little bit later. Oh, a bit of sizzle. bit of sizzle. So they're in the 1945 World Series against everyone's uh, least favourite team, the Detroit what? Tigers. <laughs> Did you know that I went for the Tigers when you asked the question? Uh, no, I didn't. And I didn't write, I must say, I've just added that in to <laughs> add a bit of extra razz. I have no idea if people over there hate the Tigers or what. I'm assuming because <laughs> they haven't been good for so long that people don't, probably don't hate yeah. them. You're not seen as a threat. <laughs> yeah. Do they pity you more than anything, do you reckon? I don't know. 84, it's not that long ago. It's no 1966, for instance, <laughs> yeah. like the St Kilda Saints. Well, Started calling them the St Kilda Saints. Did they win 66, did they? Yeah, 66. Ah. Hmm. Never heard that before. Hmm. Yeah. It's good to learn new facts, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I hope that comes up and I can use that as some sort of trivia. That'll be fun. Yeah, maybe it will. Announce it at your workplace. Oh, this is my workplace, so. <laughs> That'd be great if you could uh, announce it to us at some stage. I'll save that, yeah. All right, so 1945 World Series, the Cubs lead the Tigers two games to one and are hosting game four, remember, it's best of seven, on their home ground, and things are looking good for the Cubs. Fans, of course, want to go along and cheer on their boys, including of William course. Billy Goat Sharnas, owner of the local Billy Goat Tavern. Okay, that's why I call him... Billy Goat. He's a, a man of... Also because his name's William. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll explain the name because he's a man of Greek descent. Sianus uh, bought the tavern in 1934 when it was called the Lincoln Tavern. Apparently, he bought it for $205 with a bounced check and the proceeds from the first weekend they were open were used to pay for the bounced check. Wow. That's a good deal. $205. Paid Honestly, itself off in one week. Yeah, if you can pay it off in one weekend, you've got a good deal. Yeah. So the Billy Goat Tavern, it's still a thing. It's quite a famous venue for a few reasons. Uh, according to the Billy Goat's official website, the venue and its owner became known as Billy Goat when, quote, a goat fell off a passing truck and wandered inside. <laughs> That's fucking great. That's so good. Imagine just sitting in a bar having a drink and a goat walks in. That would be so funny. You'd go home, you'd tell all your friends. I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to wait. In this day and age, I'd be taking a picture, I'd be sending you in the group chat, I'd be like, guys, a goat just walked into this, this pub. Come on down, see this goat. This is the best day of my life. Well, Sianus adopted the goat. Grew a goatee himself and acquired the nickname Billy Goat and then changed the name of the bar to the Billy Goat Tavern. He really leaned in. Yeah, it became his whole thing. I like that a lot. Have you seen, um, there's a video I keep seeing on Facebook of this little girl pointing out the window and, and she's got an Australian accent. She says to her mum, there's a fucking goat outside. <laughs> yeah, and the mum says, no, a goat. It's just a goat. She goes, no, it's a fucking goat. <laughs> Very funny. Very good stuff. Very good, very good stuff. I was sure there'd be a goat walks into a bar joke and um, they're not good. I found two of the same one. A goat walks into a bar, bartender says, we don't serve kids. (laughs) So just for anybody who was halfway through tweeting, I'm so disappointed you missed an (laughs) joke opportunity there, there really wasn't much there to work with. Can you explain that joke? Was there like a child riding the goat or what do they mean by kid? (laughs) See, the thing is actually, Dave, that uh, a baby goat, like a like a youthful goat, is actually called a kid. What? Much like a puppy is a small dog. Oh. So a the small ba- goat is actually called a kid. So the bar owner won't serve an underage goat. Is that what they mean? If they get to a certain so age, you it's pour actually a beer? It's actually a bit of a play on words. I think it's what you would call a pun. And by that I mean there is a there are two meanings for kid. There is, of course, a small human, like a child, uh, who legally are not able to be served at a bar if they're not uh, accompanied by a, a, a guardian. Okay. And even then they cannot be consuming alcohol on premises. Right. Uh, but then on the flip side of that, it's a, it's a small goat. So what's walked in is a kid. Oh. Yeah, it's actually quite funny. Yeah, you're right. That is very funny. 
I found mm. another one. This one's uh, maybe. Can't wait to explain it to you. Maybe, <laughs> maybe to slightly it. better. A goat walks into a bar and orders a beer. The bartender says, that'll be $10, please. And no offense, but we don't get too many goats coming in here. And the mountain goat <laughs> says, no shit, $10 a beer. It's not hard to see why. <laughs> Ugh. Was there some sort of small child riding that billy goat? <laughs> <laughs> well, again from the Billy Goat Tavern's website, the Republican convention came to town in 1944 and Billy Goat, the guy that owns the bar, posted a sign saying, no Republicans allowed. This caused the tavern to be packed with Republicans demanding to be served and led to <laughs> local fame for the savvy Billy Goat being called a publicity stunt master. <laughs> but it was in 1945 that the tavern was really put on the map. So game four of the World Series, we're back there. Cubs are playing at Wrigley Field. Billy Goat goes along and he buys two tickets, one for himself and one for his pet goat, Murphy. He thought the goat would bring his team good luck. That's the plan. Oh, God. Now, there's a couple of versions of this story, but most go... Billy Goat got to the gate where he was stopped and told he wasn't allowed to bring in Murphy. There's no animals allowed inside the park. What? You can't take a goat I mean, to a baseball come game. On. What a fucking nanny state. But this isn't any goat. Nanny this goat is, state, am I right, Jess? Is that that's anything? a nanny goat state. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> but you really seem to enjoy it. Well, I wasn't oh. sure. I wasn't even sure if a nanny goat is a kind of goat. Nah. I was hoping that Jess would explain it, but she can't. <laughs> Nanny goat, it's a mum goat. They're called nanny is goats. It? Well, that's why you didn't find that very, very funny. <laughs> is that a thing? Uh-huh. They're not called nanny They're called goats. Na- are they not? Doesn't matter. They're not called nanny goats. Yeah. First thing I type, if I type nanny into Google, the first thing that comes up is nanny goat. Second is nanny McPhee. 100% wow. nanny goat. Mine is Nanny, Nanny McPhee, Nanny Melbourne, Nanny McPhee cast. <laughs> I get Nanny McPhee too, so <laughs> pretty good. What is Even a Nanny Goat? Even before I get Nanny Goat, I get Nanny Goat Pinot Noir. <laughs> it's a female okay. goat, Jess. Nanny Goat, female okay. goat. Okay, yes, that is fucking funny then. <laughs> that is very good. <laughs> and I'm actually quite genuinely impressed you had that locked and loaded. Well done. Because... I've never heard nanny goat before in my <laughs> life. And then, Matt, you had that fucking good joke and I just stared at you blankly like a piece of shit. I gave you nothing for that. That was so funny. Nanny state and nanny goat state. That's fucking great. And I ruined it for you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I need to make it clear I'm being genuine <laughs> Yeah. yeah. It's sounding so sarcastic. <laughs> it sounds so sarcastic, man. <laughs> it sounds like and for good reason. <laughs> no, that's funny. <laughs> Nanny goat, you just had that and you got nothing for it. That is cruel. That is that is unfair. I do apologize for that. That's very funny. Dave, do you need me to explain that to you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'm right on this one. Thanks, mate. <laughs> So he's brought the goat with him to Wrigley Field. He's got a ticket, but he says you can't bring it in. But he's got a ticket for the goat. He's, saying he's bought a ticket. Well, what do you people want? He's a bloody nanny goat today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> so Billy Goat, he appeals directly to the club owner, PK Wrigley, the chewing gum man, asking him why he, he couldn't take his personal mascot to the game. Wrigley allegedly told him because the goat stinks. <laughs> oh, okay. Give it some chewy then. Oh. You're the chewy man. You yeah, freshen it up. Pep out the back. Yeah, freshen I just r- realised, like, that one of the other brands of chewing gum is PK. Is that after him as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. This guy, he is chewing gum. He, his middle name's not Hubba Bubba, is it? <laughs> <laughs> PK Hubba Bubba Wrigley. That's fun to say. <laughs> Junior, so there's two. So, Sianus... The goat owner, he's deeply offended. He apparently said, as he's leading the goat away, the Cubs ain't going to win no more. The Cubs will never win a World Series so long as the goat is not allowed in Wrigley Field. Oh, holy shit. He took his goat and he went home. Wow. 
he, so did he know he had the power to do a genuine curse? Well. I mean, why would you? Why would you say it if you didn't know? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Be a weird thing to say. Yeah. It immediately started coming true because the Cubs lost the game, only scoring one run. It went to seven yeah. games the series, but the Cubs lost. So they lost the World Series. Good news for the Tigers, Matt. That's amazing. So the Tigers were the beneficiaries of the curse. Of the curse. You never would have won without this Billy Goat. So, you know. Wow. You're welcome. Thank you so much. So they lost the World Series and Billy Goat sent Wrigley a telegram saying, who stinks now? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's very good. That's so good. (laughs) The curse of the Billy Goat had just been placed and it wouldn't lift for decades. For the next 20 years, throughout the remainder of the owner of the tavern's life, the Cubs would finish each season at fifth place or lower, nowhere near qualifying. Wow. And over the years, the team's lack of success made the legend grow and grow, and many incidents have been tied to the curse of the billy goat. For example, in September 1969, the Cubs played against the New York Mets. Both were in high contention to win the pennant and get a shot at the World Series. The Cubs actually had the better record. But at the game, a stray black cat walked between the Cubs captain... A ladder. (laughs) (laughs) Of broken mirrors. (laughs) Would you believe it? The cat walked between Cubs captain Ron Santo and the Cubs dugout. They would end up losing the game 7-1... to Had the curse read its ugly head in the form of a black cat? <laughs> yes. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were knocked out and the Mets went on to win the World Series. So, yeah, I think so. Wow. Cut to 1984 and to quote from MLB.com because I love baseball talk, quote, <laughs> <laughs> The Cubs seemingly had it all during the 1984 season. A national audience on WGN, a superstar in Ryan Sandberg, and a bona fide ace in Rick Sutcliffe, who came over in a trade deadline deal. Love those yes. names. Ryan Sandberg, ace Rick Sutcliffe. They've got it all. Yeah. The season even began with the Cubs humorously tempting fate by bringing a billy goat onto the field for opening day. <laughs> and actually, it seemed to pay off. They finished the season with the best win record in the National League. That meant that they had a home ground advantage in their matchup with the San Diego Padres. People were expecting big things for the Cubs. First time in decades, go. they, got a, they got a huge shot here, huge shot. They won the first two games and were just one victory away from the World Series. But the Padres won games three and four, so it all came down to game five, winner takes all. The winner takes <laughs> it all. Did you pause there knowing I would sing? Because yeah. you said 1969 before, and you did not pause for us to say nice. And I was like, "It's like Dave doesn't even know us." Sorry, I tried to. I even I handballed you, Chicago, the Windy City. I know you. I know you. You do. <laughs> so they're down to game five. The Cubs were up three runs to two when the curse again struck. No, but they let it go two into the black stadium. Cats. <laughs> Second Black Cat's bad news on Friday the 13th. Oh, my God. Could you believe it? Couldn't be any worse. Well, first baseman Leon Durham let a ground ball go so the ball runs along his ground. Uh, Sorry, the ball runs (laughs) along the ground. His ground. (laughs) Well, he should have been covering that ground, but he let it go through his glove. It went between his legs, allowing the Padres to score a run. They went on to win the game, knocking out the Cubs. To quote again from MLB, Legend has it that a cooler filled with Gatorade was spilled in the Cubs' dugout before Game 5, soaking Durham's first baseman's glove. Did a sticky mitt hinder Durham's ability to make that fateful play in the bottom of the seventh? Sticky mitt is funny. (laughs) Normally they do that after winning, (laughs) not before losing. They did it backwards. I also really enjoy Padres as a... As a team name. I like that very much. Yeah, what does it mean, then? Papa? Is that what Padre father. means, Father? Yeah, they're the daddies. <laughs> the daddies. I like that a lot. Well, I don't, you should start a team called the Daddies, Jess. The Melbourne okay. Daddies. All right. The Melbourne baseball team is currently called the Aces. Why don't we get oh. in contact and say we want to change the name to the Daddies? The Daddies, the Melbourne Daddies. Yeah. 
Melbourne Mummies. Oh, bit of Melbourne uh, Mummies. Get phrased Bit of alliteration down. there. Yeah. Yes. It was also just a bunch of mums. Yeah, fantastic. Everybody brings the oranges. <laughs> <laughs> There's That's too many mum. oranges. Mums can play baseball too, Jess. <laughs> no, you can't. As a feminist, there are, of the pot, no, I'm step Matt. In I'm here. sorry. I'm sorry. You actually don't understand. Uh, once you have children, you no longer have a personality or uh, interests, sporting prowess, or value outside of uh, raising said children. And if you do anything, anything at all, good or bad, people are going to judge and it's a lot of fun. Well, I think you should uh, look up someone called Serena Williams. <laughs> oh, wow. Is she a baseball player? <laughs> God, I bet if she wanted to be, she'd be. Yeah, honestly, yeah. What an athlete. Um, She's incredible. So just to finish the uh, Gatorade glove, sure, some people say he'd already accepted six chances at first base without any trouble. But cursed believers believe Chicago was cursed and that the glove was yet another nail in the coffin. Because his glove was a bit sticky. Yeah, it's a sticky glove. I mean, obviously that's a curse, right? Obviously. It feels a bit like, and I use this a lot since I relearned it, confirmation bias. Mm. (laughs) Oh, okay. Well, let me confirm that bias by giving you yet another example. Okay. Because it is a powerful curse, Jess. You've got to understand this. Oh, I shouldn't be crossing this curse. Sometimes it even curses players after they've left the team. Oh, my gosh. Can you believe Wait a second. Are you saying people that played for the Cubs a long, long time ago have since died? <laughs> yes, that's right. People from that 1945 team are no longer with us. Whoa. What? Dave, you didn't mention this at the start. Sorry, I didn't want to. Now I understand. I didn't want to look biased, but there you go. The hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. <laughs> So so is the hair on your beard and it looks real weird. <laughs> I'm very self-conscious about that, Dave. <laughs> As you should be. It's weird. <laughs> okay, powerful curse. In 1984, Bill Buckner played for the Chicago Cubs for seven seasons before being traded to the Boston Red Sox. The Red Sox were also facing the curse of the great Bambino at the time, so there was a lot of curses going on in the baseball but things were looking good for his new team, the Red Sox, because they made it to the World Series final. They were playing against the Mets and were up three games to two and were only one win away from the elusive championship. The game went to overtime and the Red Sox looked poised to take it all. They only had to get one player out to win. The champagne was literally on ice and being primed to be popped. (laughs) That's how close to the win they were. They were confident. Bill Buckner, who uh, used to play for uh, the Cubs, let's not forget this, was on first base when Mookie Wilson hit the ball slowly along the ground straight to Buckner, who if he grabbed it, it would get Mookie out. Buckner went for the ball, but he missed it. The ball rolled to the left side of his glove glove through his His leg. glove? Yes, he got gloved. Into a shallow right field, allowing Ray Knight to run home and win the game. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. It was one of the most controversial plays in baseball history. People still talk about this. Why was it controversial? Because he's like a, a supposedly a really great player, but he fucked up at the, the worst right. possible time. So there wasn't co- controversy beyond him fucking up. No, it was just uh, basically <laughs> this, despite being a fantastic baseball player, like this is what he's known for. They weren't saying... They reckon he had money on the other team or anything like that. No, nothing like that. No, no. But he obviously copped it from the press and from fans. He received boos on the day and death threats after this. Many at the time said it was another example of the curse of the great Bambino. But remember, he'd started playing with the Cubs. Mm. Photographs of that infamous day were later examined and when the image was enhanced. (laughs) Oh, my God. Guess what they found. Uh, A goat. Buckner. Goat shit. There was a goat <laughs> shitting in his glove. Yes. There's a goat that startled him. It was full of goat shit. <laughs> now, what they found was Buckner had been wearing a Cubs batting glove under his glove at the moment he committed the error. The Billy Goat curse had struck yet again. Will this dastardly goat stop at nothing? Wow. That was like a double Bambini slash goat yeah. curse. He had wow. two curse twice. Double curse. Hey, Dave, you didn't mention uh, before when the Padres beat the Cubs, 
Did the out of the Padres go? They went on to the World Series. How'd that one go? Uh, did they play against the Tigers? Did they? Oh, might have played against the Tigers. <laughs> well, no one cares about them. They're the most hated team in baseball. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> no, what happened? Did did, did the that, Tigers that, beat the Padres? Yeah, that's the last World Series the Tigers have won. Eighty four. Beat the Padres. Congratulations! Thank you so much. One of my great, <laughs> well earned, great memory for me. <laughs> All right. One of the most infamous inc- incidents of the curse happened in 2003, and this is known as the Steve Bartman incident. Or less catchy, but I'm what are you listening. talking about? Do the Bartman? It was a great hit song. <laughs> Take it back. Do the Steve Bartman. Do not do the Steve Bartman. It will oh, okay. not go well for you. Is this ghost shit? Is there goat shit involved? Well, there could be. If, oh. we, if we enhance the image. Enhance. <laughs> <laughs> right, it all happened during the 2003 National League Championship Series. It was the Cubs versus the Florida Marlins. What do you think of that, Jess? Marlins. No. Oh, no. no from Jess. Makes me think of the dad in Finding Nemo. It is, a, oh, okay. it is a kind of fish, isn't it, a marlin? Yes. Yeah. Is his dad called marlin? Marlin. Right. Marlin. Oh, it's one of those words if you say it too many times it sounds Why so stupid. Why would you stupid. name a clownfish after a different kind of fish? Marlin. Big, beautiful marlin, marlin fish. Yeah, yeah, it's all done. Aren't they, aren't they the sort of big pointy ones, kind of beautiful game fish? Marlin. 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 Can you hear this? Marlin. Marlin. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah, marlins are great looking for. They got a big. They kind of. They got a big pointy nose. What is sorry? Marlin. 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 That's dumb. Are you <laughs> saying the same word? Marlin. 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 Marlin Brando. Oh, marlin, marlin Brando. That's a great name. Changes everything. <laughs> sorry, I I'm derailed. Back on board. This. Mar- I don't like marlin. What are we talking about again? Uh, we're talking about the National League Championship Series Cubs versus Florida Marlins, 2003. This is the Steve Bartman incident. It occurred in the eighth innings of Game 6 of the National League Championship Series, with Chicago leading three runs to zero. They're holding a three games to two lead in a best of seven series. If the Cubs win this game, they would win the pennant and go to the World Series. They haven't done that in a long time. Okay. Come on, fans are, Fans are getting hopeful again. Is that a mistake? Well, when you're cursed, absolutely. They're daring to dream. Dare to dream. Dare to fly. Dare to be the, the, the chosen one to touch the sky. What's this, Jess? What are you doing? Uh, Sydney 2000's opening or closing oh. ceremony. Uh, it was John Farnham and Olivia Newton-John. Oh, wow. What a wow. powerful duo. And they are walking through the athletes. Like high five, and then the Aussies are going absolutely fucking nuts. Obviously, John Farnham, Olivia Newton-John. <laughs> Every other country's cool. like, who the hell are they? Well, who are these old people? Uh, they are. Royalty. I reckon they Thank know you. Olivia Newton-John from a little movie called Grease. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say probably more John Farnham. So, who's that old man hanging out with Olivia Newton-John? I want John Farnham to adopt me. He just seems rad. <laughs> anyway, sorry, but when you say dare to dream. That's Jess, what's going to come into I my head I actually think John Farnham is featured on the soundtrack to the film Rad. Fun fact. Well, I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> is that... If I knew what that was, I, think it's like a, I would say that's pretty I think fun. it's a BMX movie that I've never seen ah. that my cousin always talks about. <laughs> <laughs> Your cousin always talks about. He always about... goes on about Rad. He can never find it. This movie Rad. <laughs> I don't know if is it, he sure it, it exists. He reckons John Farnham <laughs> played in what? one of the key scenes, maybe playing to win. What? And like you just song. brought it up like everyone would know it, and it <laughs> might not even exist. <laughs> what are you talking about? I sh- I've never looked it up. I should look it up. He talks about it a lot. Well, apparently, it's not easy to find. <laughs> Unless your cousin doesn't have access to the internet. No, I'm looking uh, just, up. I no, think you'll find. It's definitely a film. Uh, yeah. That's such a funny and specific conversation you've had <laughs> with your cousin apparently multiple times about a John Farnham song appearing in this film that he cannot find <laughs> that you've never seen or looked oh. up, but you brought it up assuming we would go, ah, oh, it's so f- a fun fact about I Rad. Should, I just <laughs> needed to look up wikipedia.org. It's got its own page. It's a 1986 American sports film. No, I can't find it anywhere. <laughs> 
<laughs> and and I've just done a, a page search for Farnham, and he's here. The soundtrack features various artists, including John Farnham in his pre-Whispering Jack days. Mm. Uh, Farnham's Break the Ice was featured on a special list of the best songs from the 80s action film montages that appeared on music website No Echo. <laughs> That's specific. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for that fun fact. I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that's qualified that as fun. <laughs> we've, got a, we've finally won over a few people who are baseball fans. Like, I'm going to give this podcast a go and they have not made it this far. Do you not think there's a big crossover between 1980s John Farnham fans and Major League Baseball fans? <laughs> but I don't think John Farnham fans would know that movie or song. I think it's pretty <laughs> obscure. I've, I've never heard the song Break the Ice by John Farnham. Oh, I don't know that one. Sounds like it breaks the ice between you and your cousins, the only thing you ever talk about. <laughs> Do you even know your cousin? Yeah. <laughs> Is this all he talks I want to call about? him after okay? the episode. You've had one conversation 20 years Do ago about this. Do you have his this. phone number? Well, I can <laughs> get nice. it. I'll, I'll ask, Text ask mom. my mum. <laughs> mum. Mums always have everybody. they got everyone's phone yeah, numbers. and the they? Rolodex. Yeah, bloody hell. All right, I've got to take you back to Bartman. It's Cubs, Marlins, uh, Cubs, very close. They're five outs away from reaching the World Series for the first time since the Billy Goat cursed them way back in 1945, and it's tense in the stadium. The Cubs are pitching. Louis Castillo. Sorry, people have, have put up tents, have they? Yeah, they're, they're, camping. they're camping out. That's, did I also tell you that the, the 162 games go for uh, five days each, <laughs> so one season lasts many years. Oh, wow, so it's like a festival. Oh, yeah. That's fine. There's a festival vibe in the stadium. Cubs are pitching. Yeah. Louis Castillo from the Marlins was at the bat with one out and teammate Juan Pierre on second base. In the crowd was Steve Bartman, a 26-year-old global human resources company worker from Chicago. He sat in aisle four, row eight, seat 11, which is the front row along the left field corner of Wrigley Field. He's a Cubs fan. He's wearing a blue Cubs hat, classic Walkman-style headphones. Oh, yeah, I love those Remember those? those? Sort of the yeah. little foamy yeah. sort of tight ones. They're the kind yes. of headphones I would have listened to John Farnham's Break the Ice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, from that film, Rad. Rad. Fucking that's rad. I love a BMX film. <laughs> uh, he's also wearing glasses and a green turtleneck poking out from underneath a black jumper. Okay. He's sitting there enjoying the game and minding his own business. He had no idea that what was about to happen would change his life forever. Ooh, oh, I hope for the best. He pooped his pants. Goat, <laughs> goat pooped his pants. He goat pooped his pants. This isn't <gasps> human poop in my pants. What's happened here? <gasps> the curse. What's happening to me? I'm pooping goat poop. <laughs> I'm slowly, my poop is turning into goat poop. Oh. What a stupid R.L. Place. Stein's done it again. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> so he's sitting there. I don't know if he's listening <laughs> to John Farnham whilst he shits himself, but he's got something in the headphones. Mark Pryor from the Cubs pitches the ball. Castillo or Castillo hits it and sends a foul ball high into the sky. Cubs outfielder Moses Alou runs round to catch it. If he makes the catch, then the Cubs will be just four outs away from the World Series. It's one step closer. The ball comes right near where Bartman is sitting. Uh-oh. Alou jumps up against the wall, desperately trying to catch it. In this moment, Bartman and a bunch of fans around him also reach out to catch the ball. It glances Bartman's outstretched hand just as Alou is reaching out, so Bartman actually makes oh. contact with Alou's mitt coming up from below. Oh, no. But neither of them are able to grab it, and the ball is knocked back into the crowd and Cubs player Alou obviously cannot make the catch. And he is fucking furious. He yells into the crowd. He throws his glove off in frustration. He looks so pissed off in the replay, like he's ready to kill someone. He's so pissed off. <laughs> now, is that is that allowed? Well, meanwhile, the ball is grabbed by a fan behind Bartman, so he doesn't even get, he didn't even get the ball either. Do you mean is it is he allowed to kill someone? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think in that moment... That's probably okay to kill. <laughs> yeah. um, is that actually in the rule? <laughs> Justifiable. <laughs> 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 
Well, there's it's actually self defense. No, if you lean over the fence and knock the ball out, is, is that is that okay? Yeah, well, there's there's a bit of confusion because the rules state if, if the ball goes into the crowd, it's well and truly up for grabs and everyone hopes to catch a, a game ball. Yeah. That happens all the time. But they're not supposed to interrupt the game and lean over the barrier. And in this instance, it's very tight. Bartman was right on the edge. Did he lean over? Yeah, maybe a little bit. He leaned over a little bit. But he certainly isn't leaning right, like right over. He's sort of a bit over. Right. And is he a Cubbies fan or is he a Florida fan? He's a Cubs fan. Oh, no. So he wanted, he wanted Alou to make the catch. He oh, wanted to make the catch. what is he doing? That's so dumb. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> well, the Cubs, they argued for a fan interference and that the catch should be awarded. They say that guy should be out because if someone in the crowd didn't touch it, Alou definitely would have caught that. Is that what it looks like? It was falling into his mitt sort of thing? Oh, uh, it's it, – he's definitely reaching and jumping up for it. Yeah. So. You can't. You probably couldn't say definitely get right. it, but probably. Yeah. But the so that's what the Cubs say. They say let's let's say interference. But Mike Everett, the umpire, rules that there's no interference because the ball had broken the plane of the wall, separating the field of play from the stands, and then it entered the stands. That call is still debated, but basically, it, what it comes down to is the batter isn't out. It's just a foul ball. That is what a nightmare spot for that ref to be in. To have to make that call, yeah. that sucks. Mm. When you know that whatever you say, people are going to argue it and hate you. Yeah. Maybe he loves that. Maybe he loves being hated. Who knows? Lo- I, don't I love to hate, I hate to love. Yeah. <laughs> when I was talking before about R.L. Stein writing a book about a, a man's shit turning into goat shit, I was actually meaning to reference Animorphs, you know, those... <laughs> Picture books where on the front it starts with right. like a, a kid and they become an animal. But on the yes. front of this book, I picture we just see a guy's pants and it starts as human shit and it slowly morphs into goat shit. Is that a better? I've explained that better. Now, I, I think I didn't want to pull you up on it, but at the time I did think well, a terrifying thing if your shit turned into goat shit. That would be. That would be a goosebump for sure. <laughs> yes. Oh, no. How would you know? Oh, you you don't know the difference between your shit and a goat shit? Jess, they taste on, very different. Up. Come on, mate. <laughs> one's got grass all the way through it and the other one's a goat shit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Was hoping you'd go there. Great stuff. Fantastic stuff. <laughs> <laughs> shit chat, your favourite. <laughs> Always. Animal shit is you know, farm animal shit I'm okay with. Mm, okay. I That's understand. why it's a beautiful story. Human shit in a goat shit is great. <laughs> Wish that happened to everyone's shit. <laughs> so, and hello to the new baseball listeners. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is kind of what the show is. <laughs> to take you back to the baseball. So, Bartman's tried to catch it. He hasn't made it. It's a pivotal moment in the game. And to quote from The Guardian, the Cubs go to pieces. Instead of closing the game out, they produce a comedy of errors and slide to an 8-3 defeat. Oh, oh no. no. And sadly, a lot of people take it out on fan Steve Bartman. Oh, I bet they do. Oh, God. Remember how I told you Wrigley Field is nicknamed the Friendly Confines? Yes. Well, that night it was anything but that. <laughs> oh, oh, poor dear. bastard. Oh, no. Bartman, <laughs> he stayed in his seat not knowing... So he just keeps watching the game, not knowing that at home Fox is repeatedly broadcasting live shots of him between multiple <laughs> replays of the foul ball. So they keep cutting back to him in the crowd. Whoa. His face and outfit become pretty recognisable to the, to the millions of people watching at home. People are <gasps> dressing up as him for Halloween and stuff. <laughs> Honestly, it, he, you, you, that year you could have. Wow. Whoa. There were, there were no screens in the stadium at the time, so not many people at the actual game knew what he looked like until people at home called their friends at the stadium and described his outfit so people could recognise him. No. Fans chanted asshole at him (gasps) and Bartman was pelted with drinks and other debris. Oh, no. No. (laughs) It's so awful. Security had to escort him out of the ground as stuff was thrown on him. And in the footage I've seen, people are taking photos of him with disposable Kodak cameras. It really feels like another time. Oh, my God. And the poor dude looks terrified. He's just trying to cover his face with his jacket. It's really awful. Oh, boy. 
That's awful. And things get quickly out of hand. His name, address and phone number <laughs> are shared on Major League Baseball message boards almost almost instantly in 2003, yeah. How? How do they how do they get that information? Someone finds it out and posts it. The mob descends and six police cars are called to his house. Get the fuck out. Cuz people turn up at his house. <gasps> That's actually has he wow. has he ever spoken about it, Dave? I want to I want to know what he was thinking. Well, there's a fair bit more to talk about. Oh no! The uh, the Illinois governor Rod Blagojevich, who was later jailed for corruption, is a bit of a wanker. He joked that Bartman should go into witness protection. <laughs> Funny joke. Classic. Not as good as the goat walking into the bar, but oh, that's good. That stuff. was truly a fucking masterpiece. <laughs> a kid, a kid. Unappreciated by us. Idiots who had never heard it. Oh, I'm still so Oh, the upset. nanny goat bit. Very strong material, that. <laughs> now, Bartman himself, remember, <sighs> he's just some guy. He issues a public apology to try and abate the mob. What? So he issues this apology publicly. He says, there are a few words to describe how awful I feel and what I have experienced within these last 24 hours. I am so truly sorry from the bottom of this Cubs fan's broken heart. Oh, I ask that Cub fans everywhere redirect the negative energy that was that's been vented toward my family, my friends, and myself into the usual positive support for our beloved team on their way to being National League champs. Oh, you poor thing! That sucks. And for that to happen, they would have to win the next game, which was the decider. So he'd be yeah, he'd be barracking harder than most for the win. Well, the the Cubs manager Dusty Baker said. We've got to win for this kid. For us, it's just a ball game. For him, it's the rest of his life. Yeah, holy shit. The Guardian also quoted his brother Martin who said, he's really hurting right now. I love him so much. I'd give up a piece of my anatomy for him, oh, which is a weird way to phrase it. That's nice. Wow. <laughs> it sounds like you're going to give him one of your balls. <laughs> Maybe he would. <laughs> I'd give up my ball, my the ball. left one, not the right. That's the good one. And I think I want kids. <laughs> Yeah, you, you've always got a favourite. You've always got a favourite. It's true. Yeah, everyone's got a favourite testy. <laughs> yeah, all right. Everyone's got one of those. <laughs> uh, because of how many games they play in baseball, then they play the, the next game the next day. So That's honestly, have a fucking rest, <laughs> would you? That's crazy. The Cubs go up early and take a 5-3 lead. Bartman looks like he's off the hook. But the curse strikes yet again. Oh. And the Cubs lose the game nine runs to five. No. The Marlins win and they go on to win the World Series. Oh, no. Bartman. Poor old Bartman. He's advised by the police not to go to work and he goes into hiding. Oh, my God. People's reaction to the guy is absolutely insane. Again from The Guardian, death to Steve Martin message boards are set up. Steve Martin's picture. even copping it now. So, sorry, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Martin has to come out and say, I was not at the game. It's not me. I'm a wild and crazy guy, sure, but I had nothing to do with this incident. <laughs> Please buy tickets to my Please, show. To my banjo show. <laughs> sorry, death to Steve Bartman message boards are set up, as well as Steve Martin, I'm sure. Uh there are pictures of Bartman in Saddam Hussein's bunker and mug shots of Bartman as the lead suspect in the Washington, D.C. sniper shootings. Oh, so my God. people are losing their minds. The Cubs released a statement after the incident and after they were knocked out saying, Chicago Cubs would like to thank our fans for their tremendous outs uh, outpouring of support this year. We are very grateful. We would also like to remind everyone that games are decided by what happens on the playing field, not in the stands. It is inaccurate and unfair to suggest that an individual fan is responsible for the events that transpired in Game 6. He did what every fan who comes to the ballpark tries to do, catch a foul ball in the stands. That's one of the things that makes baseball the special sport that it is. This was an exciting season and we're looking forward to working towards an extended run of October baseball at Wrigley Field. Oh, that's a great message. Uh, many players also stepped forward and absolved Bartman of any guilt or contribution to the team's loss, pointing out out many other things that went wrong or for other other mistakes that were made. It certainly wasn't this that was the be-all and end-all. Mm. 
But what happened to the ball? Well, it was grabbed by a Chicago lawyer sitting behind Bartman and sold at auction in December 2003 to a restaurateur, Grant DePorter, who paid $113,000 for it. Whoa. Straight away so, too. There was, yeah, that's the same year, right? Yeah, straight away. Wow. That's a spicy meatball. A couple of, <laughs> well, yeah, speaking of meatballs, a couple of months later, 2004, it was publicly detonated in a televised event by special <laughs> effects expert <laughs> Michael Lantieri. <laughs> so they exploded it in an attempt to break the curse of the Billy Code. He bought it for 100 grand and exploded it. And then he, because he owned a restaurant, he cooked a spaghetti sauce with remnants of the ball oh. used to boil in the water. <laughs> So people could eat the, the special baseball meatballs. Why would you want to do that? Eat the cursed <laughs> ball. You, <laughs> you can have a bit of curse through that? you. You will be shitting this curse out for days. <laughs> and it's going to be goat shit. Oh. Yeah. You can bet on that. Well, there have been many attempts to break the curse over the years. Sam Sianis, the nephew of the Billy Goat Man himself, has taken goats to Wrigley Field many times in an attempt to break the curse. Sadly, to no avail. He's come close. He went on opening day in 1984 and in 1989, both years in which the Cubs went on to win their division. So it kind of works, but not quite. In 2007, it was reported that a butchered goat was hung from a statue of sports broadcaster Harry Carey, to which the Chicago Sun-Times noted, quote, if the prankster intended to reverse the supposed Billy Goat curse with the stunt, it doesn't appear to have worked. Oh, well, at least, Just a butchered at least goat. the goat got uh, <laughs> hung from the thing, you know, so it was a bit of fun, even if the curse wasn't broken. Uh, at least uh, something full on like that happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah no. at least some, some meat just hung out in the open for a long time. Well, they've called in priests from different religions. They've used holy water. Nothing seems to work. And unbelievably, not even in 2015 when a team of competitive eaters ate an entire 40-pound goat in 13 minutes and 22 seconds. Oh, that's a great way to that's a great way to break a curse. They're just really eat rolling the, the dice, right? We don't understand how curses work. What if we eat it real quick? <laughs> Will that help? Different goat, but we'll eat it real quick. Well, an, <laughs> the same year, another local vegetarian restaurant went the other way and tried to get people to break the curse by going meat-free for the year. Oh. Sadly, the Billy Goat was not happy with either offering. That was that cheeky Billy Goat until <gasps> 2016, the following what? year. What? We get to the end of the season and things are looking good for the Cubs. For the season, they've won 103 games, only lost 58. It's their first 100 win season since 1935. And people are finally talking. Is this the year that the curse is broken? Stop talking about it. But then, that's right, they're also worried that this is the goat just fucking with them and no one wants to put the moss on it. You're going to everyone shut the fuck up. Be cool, be cool. It was close at one point, Dave. It's 2016, the year that, um, I think it was 2015 maybe, when uh, Back to the Future was supposedly set, when they won in Back to the Future, in the future, I think it was 2015, and they won, the Cubbies won, and it looked like they were going to win that year as well. And people are like, oh, my God, the Back to the Future prophecy is coming true. You're right. It was 2015. And I think they went quite close. I think they, I don't know if they made it to the World Series, but they they went a fair way through the postseason, I think. And people are like, here here we go. It's going to come true. Yeah. Sadly not. But 2016, looking good. They make it to the National League final series against the LA Dodgers and win in game six, their first pennant in 71 years, the first since the curse of the Billy Goat. Oh. Oh. And what day did they win it, you ask? Well, October 22nd, 2016, which was the 46th anniversary of Billy Goat Man William Sianis' death. Oh. <laughs> Coincidence? I think not. I think so. I feel like it might be a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the most well, rounded means- year or anything. For, what, 46th? Anniversary, but if you add four and six, what do you get? Ten. Oh, pretty which round. Is quite a round number. Yeah, that mm, is quite that is round. quite round. That's a good number. Ten. Thanks. You didn't invent the number ten. Calm down. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, all right, mate. <laughs> you don't own ten. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> I've tried. I've tried to patent ten. Yeah, they said piss it. off. Try eleven, and I said <laughs> I'll never do it. <laughs> 
<laughs> so because they won that, they made it to the World Series against the Cleveland Indians. However, it was not a great start for the Cubs. They were down three games to one. But the Cubs were able to come back and even the series at three games apiece, which means the winner of the next game would win the World Series. The winner takes it all. The winner <laughs> takes it all. I can't help it. I know. I didn't even have that written down. I just I improvised that for you. <laughs> so it's winner takes all and it was close. It went into extra time, which is super rare for a Game 7 at the World Series, and things were really tense. With a game tied at six all after nine innings, a sudden cloudburst resulted in a 17-minute rain delay, which is the first ever Game 7 to have a rain delay. Wow. Wow, that's a wild stat. Yeah, yeah. what a... Wow. <laughs> what a wow. <laughs> what a wow, wow. Like that's in, so that's like 100 and, well, when did this team begin? In the 1870s, you know? Yeah, I think the first World Series is 1903, so it's 113 years of. And it never, and this is the first one in Game 7. I guess it doesn't get to Game 7 all that often, maybe, or something. Because teams win in straight set sort of thing. But still, it's unprecedented. Unprecedented. Also, it's in, I'm not trying in, to talk it down, Dave. <laughs> It's also in extra time, which is so, you know, it's gone extra time because it's so close. It's, it's amazing. It's starting to feel a bit, bit cursy, like the goat is just hanging on to this curse now. Yeah. Well, during the delay, Cubs right fielder Jason Hayward calls his teammates into a weight room behind the Chicago dugout and he told them, we're the best team in baseball for a reason. Stick together and we're going to win this game. Do you think he's putting the moz on a bit there? No, that's that's belief. I think sport, it's a lot of it is about belief. Putting the moz on? What does that mean? The moz. I don't know. So it's like a curse, basically, sort of jinxing you. Putting the putting the moz on. Yeah, all right. Putting the moz. Bit of Morrissey. Put on some moz. All right. <laughs> yeah, really depressing music. Is that what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> He's putting on some depressing music, isn't he? <laughs> if you know what I mean. Dave's favorite <laughs> band for those listening at home. He loves moz. And all his political beliefs. <laughs> That's not true. I uh, do definitely like the music of the Smiths and uh, some Morrissey solo as well, I'll definitely admit. Big fan of the voice. Uh, but That's we're not here to talk about that, Moz. You love the show, The Voice. Yeah, big fan. I like their big red chairs too. Was yeah. uh, Morrissey not a judge on The Voice? How strange. <laughs> uh, whose nickname is The Voice though, Dave? Johnny Farnham. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Try and understand it, Dave. I believe he's, he's, he's also... Contributed to a few film soundtracks in his time. What, <laughs> what's that one? A few great sporting films. Oh, you're thinking of Rad. How have Rad. you forgotten Rad? Rad. Oh, fantastic. I love Dave, it. Dave, that's so embarrassing that you've forgotten Rad. I really Rad. hope there's a listener out there who's seen Rad or at least heard of Rad. <laughs> there isn't. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry there's man. not a single person. Sorry, bud. Someone's got the VHS of Rad. of Rad out there somewhere. I will not. I, I do sincerely apologise for not. Uh, backing you up on your <laughs> nanny goat state joke. The That's great. Goat. But the rad one, I could not, I do not apologize. <laughs> Please let the nanny goat bit go. <laughs> I won't. That was very good. <laughs> oh, no. That's the funniest thing you've ever said. I don't know so. what I don't... No, no, it's not the funniest thing you've ever said. You're very, very funny. But that you had nanny goat in your brain. And it just came out. It was perfect. It was perfect. It's not a perfect joke, but it was perfect for the scenario we were in. And I fucked you. I fucked you. <laughs> Sorry, what? Say again. I fucked Matt. <laughs> in that I didn't back him up. I wasn't oh. a good friend to him. I fucked him. Isn't that what we're saying? <laughs> Doesn't everyone say that? Everyone yeah. says that. I fucked him. I fucked my friend. <laughs> Fuck my friend. I fucked him. Sue me. <laughs> All right. They come back from the dugout. Ooh. They've had the pump up, the big speech, rain delay. Let's Morrissey. keep it together. After the delay, the delay, they went back out there and the Cubs scored two runs and went up eight to six. Okay. Whoa. But then the Cleveland Indians oh. scored a run of their own and it was only a one-run game. Still oh my God. super close. Michael Martinez who had scored the game-winning run in Game 3 for the Indians, was up, hoping to save the day yet again. Mike Montgomery was pitching for the Cubs, and he pitched to Martinez, who hit it along the ground. The ball picked up by Chris Bryant, 
who threw it to Anthony Rizzo on the first base before Montgomery could get there, which meant he was out. And this means the Cubs won the World Whoa, Series. No. They did it. I can't no believe way. it. They broke the. I mean, I knew this, but I still, I can't believe it the way you built it up. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thus ending the longest world championship drought in North American professional sports history. It had been 107 seasons since the Cubs last won a World Series back in 1908. The curse of the Billy Goat had finally. <sighs> Finally, been broken. That's. Can you imagine the piss up that night? Oh, I'm... obviously, they'd have to have an early one because they do have a game tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, the next <laughs> season starts. starts. <laughs> <laughs> but oh man, it feels so good. I reckon. I mean, obviously, it would feel good to win any kind of championship like that. But after such a long time, and after all the superstitions of the curse, you must have. They must have felt so. Fucking grateful oh. and lucky to be in the team at that time. That would be yeah, sick. But- Can you imagine Rizzo, who's on first base, who's got to make the catch when the guy throws it to him? Like, imagine you'd be f- the pressure. Yes. Like, if you drop it. Yeah. Oh. If you if you really bought into the whole curse thing, but I feel like, yeah, that's more for the fans, right? The players they've just been drafted in from some other city. They haven't grown up with this curse weighing them down. And, uh, yeah, so hopefully it wouldn't be in their head because if it was, you know, maybe you'd get a bit shaky. But I imagine he's just thinking, yeah. I catch balls all day. This is what I do. Yeah, yeah I do this thousands of times. Uh, that guy, Rizzo, he called the rain delay the most important thing to happen to the Chicago Cubs in the past 100 years. I don't think there's any way we win the game without it. Really? So. Oh, wow. Whoa. So that was real reverse curse stuff. Yeah. Maybe the billy goat brought the rain. Right. I was genuinely starting to think, wait, did they break this curse? <laughs> the way it was going, it really felt like maybe it was going to be cursing on. No, sadly, well, happily I should say, the curse was broken. But And they've just won every year since. Yeah, that's right. It's super dull, super boring now. <laughs> Predictable. But there's one little loose end to tie up here, and that is what about our friend Steve Bartman? Yeah. The guy who absolutely copped it in 2003, oh, had his life turned upside down. Well, he's actually completely shunned the limelight over the years. He's been offered to pitch the first ball. He didn't want to do it. He's reportedly turned down a six-figure sum to appear in a Super Bowl ad. Wow. What? He's denied fans who have offered him $25,000 to sign a photo. He doesn't want anything to do with them. ESPN even made a documentary about him called Catching Hell and he declined to be involved. He just doesn't want any attention. So it ruined his... It sounds like it's really ruined him a bit. Yeah. However, the club itself has not forgotten him. When the Cubs won the World Series in 2016, the club and its owners sent Bartman a championship ring as a special gift. Which is the same as the same ring given to championship players. It features 108 diamonds and even wow. says Bartman on it. Wow. Whoa. Oh, that's that's so nice. Because he really did go through hell by the sounds of it. Yeah. Well, they released a statement saying, we hope this provides closure on an unfortunate chapter of the story that has perpetuated throughout our quest to win a long-awaited World Series. While no gesture can fully lift the public burden he has endured for more than a decade, we felt it was important Steve knows he's been and continues to be fully embraced by this organisation. Oh, that's so nice. After all, after all his sacrifice, we are proud to recognise Steve Bartman with this gift today. Oh, that's lovely. Absolutely wow. lovely. And he, he released a statement in reply. Like he did this all quietly. He didn't want to, you know, be in the limelight, like I said, but he said... In a statement, although I do not consider myself worthy of such an honour, I am deeply moved and sincerely grateful to the to receive an official Chicago Cubs 2016 World Series championship ring. I am fully aware of the historical significance and appreciate the symbolism the ring represents on multiple levels. My family and I will cherish it for generations. Most meaningful is the genuine outreach from the Ricketts family, they're the people who own the, the club these days, on behalf of the Cubs organisation and fans, signifying to me that I'm welcomed back into the Cubs family and have their support going forward. I'm relieved and hopeful that the saga of 2003 and the foul ball incident surrounding my family and me is finally over. Oh. So 
he got a bit of closure, hopefully. Yeah, and it sort of it must. It sounds kind of like uh, people had moved on anyway. Fans wanted to get his autograph and stuff. He'd become more yeah. of a like a. It's just a part of their history, but at the time, yeah, that's very awful. hairy stuff. Not great for him was that every time they came close to winning again, he'd come back in the news and people would be do things like, where is he now and stuff right. like that. And he yeah. didn't want any attention like that. So he was, I think he's hoping uh, that, you know, by, they finally won. It's all good. They've recognised him. He said it's cool. Yes. We don't have to do it anymore. His yeah. own little curse is now broken. Yeah. I wonder what, like, it's just no game sense to be like, my team needs to catch this ball. <laughs> just, le- I just. It does seem a bit strange that, but it would have, I guess, it was a rush of blood. Oh, yeah, and you have like a split second to react. Yeah, yeah, and then also recognize, hey, am I, you know, ten centimeters yeah, over is the it barrier right here? Over the barrier or not? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's right. I'm looking at pictures now. He's not a pro baller who would know exactly where the ball's going, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, but it's kind of interesting that everybody else around him, except for one other person has pulled their hands oh, back. Oh, right. So they all knew. There's everybody kind of doing this like a Ooh, kind of move. There so are, they've pulled back. There are other people who definitely reach for it and that's what I feel bad yeah. for him because, like, it could have been anyone else who's the one who actually touched it. Exactly, yeah. Great report, Dave. Great story. Yeah, what a story. I knew absolutely none of that. So that was a, that was a real roller coaster for me all along. I also didn't know about nanny goats. <laughs> We've all learned something here today because I didn't know that. <laughs> and you've learned about the song Dare to Dream by Olivia Newton John and John Farnham. Yes, I'll send you a YouTube link later, guys. You can have a look. Thanks so much. I look forward to uh, listening to that. And then uh, the full soundtrack to the movie Rad. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I mean, obviously, I listen to that at bedtime every night, but I'll do it twice. That tonight. Olympic song, I'm pretty sure, was written by, like, it was a competition. Uh, uh, anyone could uh, enter their. Australian Olympic theme, I think, and on the dream. Okay, well, you went from not knowing, not knowing the song at all, to now you've got. Well, some I don't, I don't know the, the winning song. The songs I know were the runners up, which um, <laughs> on the dream, which was Roy and HG's show during the Olympics, they uh, they played <laughs> the runners up beforehand, and they were very funny. <laughs> <laughs> and and one of them, Farnsey, came into the studio and sang with the the people who, who came runners up in the thing. It was it was called uh, "Put a Gap in Them." Go, you good thing. Go, put a gap in them. Go. And then Farnsey comes into the studio and sings no. it in front of the green screen of the the couple who entered the song. And it's just a magic moment <laughs> of Australian TV. I'll share it with you two later. See so if maybe we'll share it with the listeners <laughs> during the week. On our socials. I'll also try and put out the clips of, yeah, Steve Bartman and stuff. <laughs> yeah, maybe more relevant. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But, yeah, okay. You want to keep it relevant, sure. But, but yeah, know, if you want to check out more of the uh, the footage, I'll, I'll put links uh, in the description of this episode if you want to see what Bartman looks oh, like I'm for yourself. Oh, I'm looking at that photo. Yeah, that is, oh, it is stiff. Oh. Yeah. But, man. Yeah, it hurts to it look at. It does hurt. Yeah, I mean... I feel for him, but I also like he should have he should have known not to. Yeah. But anyway, you're right, Dave. It's millimeters, split, split second seconds. Thing. Yeah. Poor bastard. Is, oh, I feel for tough. him with the Walkman headphones on. I know. Ugh. Oh, he's just the guy who loves baseball. He just looks like a sweet nerdy guy. Oh no, mm. <laughs> Steve, you've broken my heart. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna think about that all night now. Oh, Steve, that is such a sad. I wish I didn't look at the photo. Oh, well, people look up Steve Bartman. Him, those fucking assholes. Oh man, yeah. look up Steve Bartman ring. And you'll see that the the ring with over a hundred diamonds in it. Hopefully, that'll make you feel a little bit better. Yeah, diamonds, which, as you know, Matt, a lot of worth. <laughs> oh, so that make you feel oh, better, man, Steve. Oh my God, it's so many diamonds. That's crazy. I gotta stop saying crazy, but it is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that is my report on the curse of the billy goat. Well done, Dave. Thank you so much Great. for that. What a treat. Thank you. Great work, Dave. And now it's almost time for everybody's favorite section of the show. But before we get to that, by the way, it's just Dave here now. Um, I had to let the others go. 
Um, they just weren't pulling their weight. You understand. No, what's happened is uh, Melbourne has gone into a snap one week now, two week lockdown due to COVID stuff, and it's getting a little bit tricky to uh, find time where we can get together. Uh, we've been doing a bit of Zooming stuff, but uh, it was decided that I would be trusted with uh, doing the next section of the program. But I've also been trusted with making a, a special announcement, and that is now back in April and May, we were absolutely stoked before we went into lockdown to do four live shows, our first in 18 months, in front of a real crowd in Melbourne. We were upstairs at the European Beer Cafe, had the absolute time of our lives, and the good people at Stupid Old Studios filmed, edited, and produced those four episodes, and you can now watch those at sospresents.com. So the four episodes, we did the McDonald's Monopoly heist, we did the Kentucky, Kentucky Meat Shower, the surreal life of Salvador Dali, and who could forget the masquerade treasure hunt. And uh, basically you get to watch the show as if you're in the crowd, so that means we had to edit out a bunch of stuff that didn't make sense uh, if you were just listening to the audio. There's a bit of regret face in there, a few other interactions with crowd members, that sort of stuff. And at the end there's a... A little bit of uh, behind-the-scenes stuff on the, the back of each episode, so you will see stuff that no one else can see, and you can buy tickets to those, basically. Uh, there's a season pass. You get all four shows. It's 30 Aussie dollars to see all four, or uh, if you're uh, a Patreon supporter, you can uh, use a little discount that we posted about in Patreon to get a, some cheaper tickets, and, uh, yeah, you get all four of those episodes. So go to sospresents.com or click the link in the description of this very episode. Lots of fun, and, uh, yeah, thanks so much to Stupid Old Studios for uh, making those happen. Really, really cool. All right, now that's done, it is time to get to everybody's favourite section of the show, which is the fact, quote, or question, which has a little jingle that I believe goes a little something like this. Fact, quote, or question. I always remember the ding. Now, this is the section of the show where we uh, get to thank some of our Patreon supporters. And if you want to be one of those fantastic people, you can go to patreon.com slash do go on pod. And when you're there, you sign up to support the show, you give us a pledge, and uh, each month we'll give you bonus content. So there's three bonus episodes that we put out every single month, as well as access to the previous 110 plus episodes that we've now put up. So you get instant access to all the extra stuff. You get to be in the Facebook group. You get to vote on episodes. This episode that I just did about the Billy Goat, I put up three sports topics and uh, this one was narrowly voted into the number one spot by the Patreon supporters. So you really do get to change the outcome of the show as well as get shout outs and all sorts of stuff as well as if you're on the Sydney Shinebag Deluxe Memorial Package Rest in Peace level, which is one of our top tiers, uh, you get to... Uh, Enter yourself into the fact, quote, or question where you uh, give us a fact, a quote, or a question as well as a nickname for yourself. And we've got four here to go through this week. And the first one comes from Jamie Griffiths. Thanks, Jamie, whose nickname is Head of Inhuman Resources. <laughs> Am I right? Jamie, I love that. It's good stuff. That is very good stuff. And Jamie's given us a question, and that is, what podcasts do you guys listen to or recommend? Oh, man. So many. So many that I... Uh, what are, I'll just pull out my phone, you know? Go through that here. Go through the podcast. App. Oh, now, number one, I've been absolutely smashing this lately, and that is basically BBC radio programs. There's uh, the BBC World Service. They have a show called Witness, and uh, they have a massive archive that they have uploaded to... Apple Podcasts is where I've been listening to this. Uh, Witness Archive 2013 I've been going through and they go through some uh, very interesting stories from history, little programs. They're about nine or ten minutes each. And, yeah, they go through stuff from history. They interview people on the scene. Um, it's just these little reports and I'm, I love it. I go for a drive and I, listen, I just put it on shuffle basically and listen to three or four of those in a drive. Uh, what else we got? I listened to uh, Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend, Conan's show, which I know Matt really likes as well. The most recent one, he interviewed Barack Obama, so that was really cool. Don't You Know Who I Am? 
No secret here that I absolutely adore Josh Earl's show. So, so fun. It's been going for five, six years now and he gets four very, very funny people and quizzes them about their lives and basically gets them to tell their best stories. Six years later, I'm still like, that's the best pod in the country. I love it. Uh, Answer Me This, another one that I've been listening to for many, many years, Helen and Ollie, two great British uh, podcasters that have been in the game for like 14 or 15 years or something, very, very early to it. And uh, their show, they just answer listeners' questions. And I still love it. What else have we got? I've got uh, Song Exploder. Love that when they go through music um, or songs from musicians and they pull apart their songs. Uh, Willosophy, Will Anderson's program where he interviews people as well. He's just a great interviewer and it's just only getting better and better. I love that. Bit of the Weekly Planet. We love those guys. What else we got here? Uh, the Debrief with Dave O'Neill where uh, he does a gig and uh, drives back from the show with the comedian that he's done the show with and uh, interviews them in the front seat and they debrief about the gig. I think that is awesome. Dan Carlin's Hardcore History. Absolutely love that. That is just one of the best. The Adam Buxton podcast, another great interviewer, very just super casual English dude. Yeah, I love his style. And he also always starts the episodes by walking around the paddock. Um, he lives out in the countryside and he, him and his dog Rosie and he just addresses the interviewer whilst walking. I just, just love that. Uh, the Grub with uh, last week's guests Ben Russell, uh, Ann Edmonds and Greg Larson. Very, very funny. And finally, another one I've been listening to for years, and that is Pappy's Flat Share Slam Down. Three English comedians. Uh, and they, they do a few different shows on the one feed, but my absolute favourite is Flat Share Slam Down, which is a panel quiz show where one of them is the host, the other two are team captains, and they bring on a friend each and they pretend that they're living in a share house and they've got a problem. It's very, very silly. Been going for years, and they've still been going during COVID, which is awesome to see. All right, there's a, a bunch of stuff that I listen to. A lot of comedy things in there, isn't there? Apart from the BBC Witness stuff. Man, love it. It's re- really gotten into that lately. Thanks, Jamie. Let us know. What are you listening to? Always keen to hear about more pods out there. Uh, next up we have uh, Stephen Headley, whose nickname is King of Pies in the United Kingdom. Well, from a pie guy to a king, I bow down before you. And you have some great pies in the UK. Absolutely love your pies. Uh, and a fact from the king, which is, it's a royal fact, Queen Elizabeth's nickname is Gary. Prince William, as a young boy, could not pronounce Granny. Instead, he called her Gary. I <laughs> love that. Do we talk about on the Queen Elizabeth episode? I feel like that kind of rings a bell, but maybe that's just Matt's obsession with Gary has brought that up. I don't know. It was many years ago. But thank you very much for bringing that to our attention Queen Elizabeth, a.k.a. Gutty. Uh, next up, John Mulligan. Thank you so much for your support, John, whose nickname is Chicago's Favourite Milkman. John, are you seriously a milkman? Don't know if I've ever met one. <laughs> Not really a thing here anymore. Gosh, that'd be awesome. Uh, and if you are Chicago's Favourite Milkman, that would be great. Uh, and also, I probably should say, bearing the lead here, are you a Cubs fan? Huh? Were you stoked when they finally broke the curse? Maybe. Maybe less of a White Stockings fan and more of a White Sox fan, though. Am I right? Well, anyway, John, giving us a question. And that is, if you were to nerd out on one topic from your young, your young teen childhood on an episode for a topic, what would that topic be? And I've got to tell you, for me, I've already done it. It was The Simpsons. That is uh, a topic that I, yes, myself near and dear to growing up. It's still absolutely the best show ever. But um, maybe another TV show would be Diagnosis Murder. I was a huge, huge fan of that. Would love to talk Dick. Uh, Van Dyke, of course. Uh, Shane, his grandson, Barry, his son. <laughs> he managed to cast the entire Van Dyke family. There was another, there was another brother in there. Uh, and, and also uh, the, the daughter of Dick Van Dyke was on the show. Oh, so, so good. I love it. Um, but I'm trying to think of other things that I was super nerdy on. Pokemon, absolutely obsessed with it. And they've been back in the news this week with the Pokemon cards apparently going up several hundred percent in value this year when people in lockdown. Um, and I still have a bunch of the Pokemon cards. So I'm thinking, am I sitting on an absolute gold mine? I think I had... I was stoked when I was a kid because I filled up 
uh, two pages of the shiny holographic things in in the booklet. You know, you get those little plastic sleeves and display them. And there was three rows of three, and you flipped it over. There was another three rows of three, so I had eighteen shiny ones. One of them may have been a Japanese Snorlax, but still, maybe that's the most valuable one of all. I don't know. Yeah, but I never got Charizard. Never got Charizard or Blastoise. Had Venusaur. Never Charizard or Blast. So that were the two that, that eluded me when uh, in the original 150. I feel like those were the, the shiny ones that I was the holographic. But in Australia, in my primary school anyway, they were called shinies. It'd say, "You want you want you got a you want to trade a shiny?" <laughs> that sounds so weird now, doesn't it? Um, so I could nerd out about Pokemon cards. Absolutely loved it. Could also nerd out about Pokemon Red and Blue. Love the games. Uh, last year, I on Nintendo Switch got Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu, which is basically that game but remade um, with better graphics and stuff. Absolutely loved it. So yeah, John, Pokemon. I could nerd out about that. I think that actually would make a good episode because you know, from humble beginnings to it, like the a massive franchise. It's one of those things I can't believe that, like when I was a kid, it was massive. Obviously, this is now over twenty years ago. And then my uh, younger cousins came along and they were 10, 11 years younger than I was, still massive. And I thought, wow, I can't believe that this is still big. And then a decade after they're into it, it's I know, it's got no sign of slowing down. Is it the longest running fad? Something to think about there. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Chicago's favourite milkman, John Mulligan. And finally, I would like to thank uh, Tessa Chilcott, who's given us the nickname, Queen of the world, in brackets, said in Leonardo DiCaprio's voice from Titanic, you're queen of the world! Tessa. Was that all right? Uh, and finally, a quote. We don't get too many quotes and uh, I love them. And I've, Obviously, without even reading this, I'm going to say, I'm going to set my life by this quote. Here we go. Two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. <laughs> and who said that? Albert Einstein. Hey, if he knows, it's probably true. I meant to say if anyone knows, my goodness. I'm proving his point there's stupidity. So thank you so much to our fact quote or questioners. And now it's time to thank a few more of our Patreon supporters. If you are supporting the show at patreon.com slash do on pod, like I mentioned before, one of the rewards is also you get a shout out for being such a legend. And uh, I've got uh, nine names before me now. And I'd like to thank these people. And we usually come up with a bit of a game on here. Something to do with uh, with the episode and uh, with Matt and Jess's blessing. I've decided that I'm going to assign each member here a baseball team, but not a major league baseball team, more of a minor league team or another team from around the world. I've got uh, a few different lists open, and I'm going to assign you uh, assign you a baseball team. <laughs> Uh, some of them really made me laugh when I found these lists. Uh, but first up, I would like to thank uh, from an unknown place. Got no information about where this person's from. I can only assume they're from the Fortress of the Moles. Is there, oh, let me see. There's a baseball team called the Moles. There's Fenton Mole, nicknamed Muscles, an American Major League Baseball player, born in 1925. I think coming up immediately. All right, don't worry. I've got a list here. I've got some good stuff either way. But I'd like to thank Robert Clark. Robert Clark. And I'm going to to, uh, to assign you uh, the team name. It's This is a, an Aussie one playing in the ABL, the Australian Baseball League, the Brisbane Bandits. And the the, the uh, mascot or the at least the image uh, for the team, the logo, is uh, a very sinister-looking dude with uh, a hat on and then like uh, something covering his face, like a real roadside bandit. Handkerchief over the, over the, the mouth and nose. You can only see the eyes. A real bad ass. And I, I'm sensing that you are too, Robert Clark. You want to give away where you are? You have the metaphorical hat and <laughs> thing over your face. Can't think of the word. Anyway, you're a bandit. Robert Clark, thanks so much. Uh, next up, I'd like to thank from Lemington Spa in Great Britain. Thank you so much to Lucy Barrington. Lucy Barrington. Now, I'm going to give you, Lucy, the team, the Montgomery Biscuits. Montgomery Biscuits. 
got to see this logo. There's, a, there's an M and then peering out from behind it with two little hands and then googly eyes is a biscuit. <laughs> it's a biscuit with googly eyes. Apparently they are affiliated with the Tampa Bay Rays in the MLB in the double, the class is double A. The name was chosen from thousands of entries in, an, in, name the te- in a Name the Team contest because it sounded fun, quirky and could be utilised for marketing opportunities like naming the team store the Biscuit Basket. Puns such as Hey Butter 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 also <laughs> appealed to the owners when selecting the name. This is according to sports, thesportchief.com. So thank you so much. I hope you're happy with that, Lucy Barrington. Uh, next up, I would like to thank from... Uh, Cor Peru in Queensland. Maybe uh, you already support the bandits. Cor Peru in Queensland. Alison Pottinger. Alison Pottinger. Uh, let me go back to my list here. I'm going to give you, <laughs> this is not a good one, the Batavia Muck Dogs. The Batavia Muck Dogs. Their logo is a very, very angry looking pup. They're a collegiate summer baseball team of the perfect game collegiate baseball league located in New York State. Batavia Muck Dogs. Man, that's good. Love that. All right. Thanks, Lucy. I would like to thank, uh, sorry, thanks, Alison. I would like to thank next from Elwood, right here in Victoria, Jim Bates. Jim Bates. Jim Bates. I'm going to give you, Jim, the Clinton Lumber Kings. Clinton Lumber Kings. There's a dude with a very big eyebrow. He's popping it like The Rock when he was a wrestler. He's wearing a, a crown and then holding a bat, giving a cheesy. Cheesy grin. Clinton Lumber Kings. Where are they from? Let me look that up. Uh, also collegiate summer baseball team. They are located in Clinton, Iowa. Love that. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, next up from uh, LV, also in Victoria. LV, LV, Tyson Graham. On your Tyson, you absolute legend. All right, I'm going to give you the, the team The Amarillo Sod Poodles. <laughs> the Amarillo Sod Poodles, which they have that name to the large number of prairie dogs in West Texas. Thank you so much, Sod Poodle. Tyson Graham, your ledge. Uh, from Amez in Iowa. My goodness. Oh, yeah, we're heading, heading to Iowa with Cal- Caleb Devick. Caleb Devick. Probably Devic. Caleb Devic. Caleb, I can't talk right now. Caleb Devic. <laughs> Caleb Devic. I don't think that's right in anyone's language. Uh, thank you so much, Caleb. Look, we get names down under as well, all right? Um, let me give you a, a, a baseball team. How, how about this? Are you happy with the Pensacola Blue Wahoos? The Pensacola Blue Wahoos. They're a minor league baseball team of the AA South, affiliate of the Miami Marlins. They are, of course, based in Pensacola, Florida. The Blue Wahoos. I really like that. Hopefully you do too, Caleb slash Caleb. I know. I know what it is. Uh, Thank you so much. I would like to thank from Mermaid Waters in Queensland, Philippa Hyatt. Mermaid Waters. Now, that is good. Is there a mermaid baseball team? Let me look that up. Mermaid baseball teams. There are the Miami Marlins Mermaids, who, according to MLB.com, are the sort of uh, cheer squad, it looks like, uh, strong, empowered, confident women focused on our team, our fans, and our community. All right, that's not quite that. All right, I'm going to find you a baseball team. Let me get you something out. All right. Philippa, how would you like the Binghampton Rumble Ponies? Yes, please, is what I think you'd be saying. That's an amazing. They're associated with the New York Mets, again, from the sports chief. They're not all from the sports chief, but this one is, uh, if you don't know, like me, the author says, Binghampton is part of what people call the triple cities along with Endicott and Johnson City. And these triple cities are referred to as the carousel capital of the world. So to honour that name, naturally, the Rumble Ponies were born in 2016 to replace the Binghampton Mets. Much cooler. Love it. Rumble ponies, cool logo too. It's like a a pony going into battle wearing uh, some armour over their face. Super cool. Philippa, thank you so much. 
Next up, I would like to thank, and yes, I have definitely Googled how to say this because it is a confusing looking word written down from Ypsilanti in Michigan. Did I get it right? Uh, thank you to Sam Cash. Sam Cash from Ypsilanti. Also says here, often called Ipsy. I think that's pretty cool. And I'm going to uh, give you the team name, the Midland Rockhounds. The Midland Rockhounds. And it is an absolutely badass looking dog. Rocking, rocking a sweet, sweet baseball bat in his in his hand. Oh, I love it. They're from Midland, Texas, in the minor leagues. Very cool stuff. Great logo. Look it up if you can. Sam Cash. Thank you so much. And finally, from Belly Claire in Great Britain, I would like to thank Katie Skillen on your Katie. And uh, I've got two here to go here. And uh, it's got to be the Rocket City Trash Pandas associated with the LA Angels. They're located in Madison, Alabama. The name is a reference to the city or the area's ties to the space industry and raccoons who supposedly have a lot of determination and ingenuity. The Rocket City Trash Pandas. That is awesome. And that's your team. Katie, do with it what you will. So thank you so much to all the people, Robert, Lucy, Alison, Jim, Tyson, Caleb, Philippa, Sam and Katie for supporting the show. And with that, there's only one thing left to do and that is check if we've got any members to induct into the Triptych Club. And the way this works is these are the people that have been on the shout-out level or above consistently for three consecutive years. And boy, oh boy, are we grateful for them keeping up their pledge and keeping this show rocking and rolling for those years. Because of that, we've actually built a little club, a place that they can come and hang and be with their kin. And also us, we hang out there a lot. Um, It is the Trip Ditch Club. It's everything you want to be and nothing you don't want it to be. Too many negatives there? I don't know. Not enough time to go back and count it. But basically, it's a fantastic place to hang out. We have live music. We have a bar with drinks. We have food. And uh, every week we uh, we get a new act in to come and play. And uh, we also have a new drink to add to the menu and also food to add to the many, many dozens of canapes <laughs> that we have. We have to hire a new chef every week to keep up with the, with the demand. It's crazy. We're wasting a lot of food, but still, I mean, once you add a food, you've got to keep it up. Uh, so <laughs> you're never going to believe this. I, I Googled, ah, oh, with Chicago Cubs was this, this week's episode. I, so I Googled Chicago band that we can hire and uh, you're never going to believe who came up. The band Chicago, <laughs> they are from Chicago. Uh, so thank you so much to uh, the Chicago guys coming down, uh, playing a few of their tunes that they, uh, they've been uh, rocking and rolling with since 1967. So can't wait to hear that. Uh, then I Googled, uh, what about Chicago drinks? What can we have on the menu? And then they're never going to believe this either. The Chicago cocktail comes up. A brandy-based mixed drink probably named for the city of Chicago, Illinois. Good enough for me. And uh, then I Googled, uh, no, actually, I knew this. This is something I've been wanting to try. I've never had it before, and that is Chicago deep dish pizza is on the menu tonight. Chicago-style pizza prepared according to several different styles developed in Chicago. So we'll have to have several different types of deep dish pizza. We'll go around and we'll rate our favourite. All right, let's check if there are people to uh, to induct into the Triptych Club. We've got uh, Matt standing by, lifting up the velvet rope, and uh, it's my job to hype these people up as we welcome them in. And there is, oh, my goodness, we did something good three years ago to get people into the Patreon because there are 14 to go through this week. Okay, so what I do is uh, I give them a little hype up, and usually Jess or Matt uh, hypes me up as after as I hype these people. Obviously, it's just me. So I'm going to have to pretend that this is going better than it obviously will, okay? So I need you to believe, like I wish I had some sort of hype crew here, but I don't. I've just got to go solo. So these are the people. Hopefully this isn't the most embarrassing thing I've ever done. All right, I've done it before, but never 14. Okay, here we go. I would like to thank and welcome into the Trip Ditch Club. All right, here we go. I would like to thank uh, from Evat. Evett in the Australian Capital Territory. It's Ansys Eversons. You're every son to me. Yes, what does it mean? It sounds positive. Keep it going. I'd like to thank from Columbus, Ohio. Shout out to one of our favourite states. I'd like to thank uh, Jackie Quavillan. 
Jackie, you ain't no villain. Yeah, you're a hero. Come on in. All right, that was a little bit better. We'd like to thank from uh, from Cheshire now, uh, Katie Higgins. Uh, Cheshire's to you, <laughs> Katie Higgins. All right, thank you so much. Uh, staying in Great Britain from Mon Monofeith. I would like to thank uh, Kieran McCleary. <laughs> Never weary with. Kieran McCleary. Yes, yes, that was good. All right. Uh, that's a few down. Many more to go. Here we go. Keep it going. From Li- Lisburn, also in Great Britain, Noel Walker. Uh, keep walking. No, smooth talker, Noel Walker. All right, come on in. I would like to thank from Bendigo in Victoria, here in Australia, Megan Harrison. Bendy, go on in and have a great night. Bendy, go on in. Hmm? Is that something? Megan, thank you so much. Now, from Sydney, New South Wales, Michael Nielsen makes me feel sin. Feel good, that is. Yes, all right. Now, from Yukon in Oklahoma, Lauren Roselle. Yukon, count on a good night. Yeah, all right. From, I'm just shouting this in my empty house. I sound insane for the neighbours. From Eureka in California, Andrew Barney. Eureka, we've struck gold with this guy. Oh, yeah. Uh, (laughs) That was pretty good. Uh, From uh, Hervey Bay in Queensland, Brianna Barney. Another Barney. Uh, I ain't being smarmy. You rule, Brianna. All right. Two Barneys in a row. Uh, Different sides of... Planet Earth, but maybe you know each other. Come on in, hang out, have a Chicago cocktail. I would like to thank now from Fairport Harbour, also in Ohio, great state, Thomas Fazekas. Uh, Fairport to you, sir. It's meant to sound like uh, fair play. Fairport, fair play to you, sir. All right, moving on, Thomas, you're a legend. Uh, from Berlin now in Deutschland, Silk Westendorf, more like... Bestendorf. Can we end there? God. All right, what do we get left? Thanks, Silk. Silk A, I should probably say. Uh, from Naganawal in also the Australian Capital Territory, Reese Elbress and Bronwyn Duke. It ain't no fluke. You're here together tonight. All right. Thank you so much. And finally, from Fairbanks in Alaska, it's Rosa Spicer. Couldn't be nicer. Do we do it? Oh, my goodness, I had so many doubts about that. I still don't know how it went. But, you know, I feel like that was something. That was something. I yelled some names in my house. (laughs) I tried a couple of rhymes, a couple of bad puns, a couple of things that probably honestly weren't anything. But you know what? I tried. And I would like to thank all those people, honestly, uh, because they are people that have been supporting the show for three-plus years, building up to that moment. I hope that was everything they wanted it to be and probably more. (laughs) Thank you. <laughs> Don't worry, Matt and Jess will never hear this. Um, so thank you so much to those people. You are absolutely fantastic. And if you want to be involved with that, I mean, and who doesn't want to have their name shouted out by Dave Warnke in the middle of his house, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash pod. Heaps of bonus episodes up there for you to get through and uh, lots and lots of other stuff. That's it from me. Thank you so much for listening to the end of the episode. Truly appreciate that. All the links to all of our stuff is at dogoonpod.com, our Facebook, our Instagram, our Twitter, our email, where you can suggest a topic, our Patreon, where you can buy merchandise and we can send it to you anywhere in the world. You can go to dogoonpod.com. But I'm pretty sure that's it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And until next week, hopefully we'll be all back together again. But until then, I'll say thank you so much and goodbye. Goodbye.